so when you started, you talked about writing poems mm -hmm. at the beginning. And, and there was a moment where the guitar came along. Tell us about that. What was that like? I was 12 years old. Um, my brother, my oldest brother, John, had uh, a guitar. And I would sneak into his room and I would learn chords using the Peter, Paul, and Mary songbook and the Bob Dylan songbook. And they had the little chord charts above the lyrics. And they were all wrong. The chords were not correct most of the time, but I just started playing it. My parents noticed that I was getting kind of serious about this, and they bought me a little guitar uh, from Musicland. Music uh, it was a horrible guitar, but I loved it. And was I this also to keep the peace? Because you were using his guitar, was there a I think problem? So, was, probably. Was an issue? I think okay. it was. I think we better get Anne her own guitar. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, I continued to learn. I, I joined my church folk group, so I was around people who were playing the guitar, and I learned a little bit more from that. Um, when I went into high school, it seemed like everybody was playing the guitar. There were really good guitar players at Minnetonka High School, and we would hang out in the hallways. We would trade what we were doing, um, and I, I learned a great deal from that experience. But I had started to write poetry when I was in junior high school because I was kind of a miserable <laughs> adolescent. <laughs> My adolescence was not fun. Um, I, I was pretty confused because I, I, I didn't know that I was a lesbian. I didn't know what a lesbian was. And uh, all throughout my uh, junior high and high school years, I just thought I was sort of defective in some way because I, I didn't understand. Nobody was talking about it. Mm -hmm. so, so you, know, you weren't feeling what they were telling I you was, you should be feeling. Yeah, and yeah. you know, I, you'd go to these parties and the girls were all talking about the boys and you'd sit there and go, huh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> huh, that, that doesn't sound right to me, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so I mean, all of that was part of the, the adolescent angst, you know, and I had the outlet of... Uh, of writing poetry. And right, that, that, that feeling of being somehow out of place and not in step mm -hmm. with your peers right. is important to a lot of creative people. I think it's, so. It's I think where so, yeah. many things, many good things begin. Yeah. yeah. So you brought that poetry into your, your playing the guitar as, okay, as, as intentionally writing songs. You were saying, I'm going to take this poem and and put it to a tune? I, I didn't do that because a lot of my poems didn't rhyme and you know that kind of kills it right there. I mean, there are a lot of people who have written songs that don't rhyme and uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, I did intentionally sit down then when I started listening to, I started to go to concerts by, uh, my first concert was Peter, Paul and Mary. My oldest brother took me to the concert and this was probably 1967, 68 and they were at the Minneapolis Convention Center. And I just remember this so clearly that they were at that old convention center, huge floor. I don't know how many thousands of people sitting there. And it was like being in somebody's living room. These people, these three little people on the stage could make this intimate place. They were funny, they were engaging, they got the audience involved. And I just sat there and I thought, wow, this is for me. I, I love this. But then I started listening to other people who were writing the songs that Peter, Paul, and Mary, I mean, Peter was writing some songs. I mean, they did write some songs, but when I got into the songwriters um, and Joni Mitchell and Bob Dylan and, and the rest, I, that's when it really opened up for me. And I thought, oh, you, this is how it works. This is, this is like poetry and then <laughs> you mm -hmm. put them together and, you know, and you, you start imitating the people that you admire when you start out. You start, you know, it's like writers kind of imitating their favorite writer and their style. It was the same thing. It was imitating um, the way that, you know, trying to imitate the way these people were writing. And then you end up with your own style because you can't. I mean, you you just can't be them. You can't successfully mimic somebody no, forever. No, no. It just develops. Yeah, yeah. So in that group of, of high school uh, guitar players, mm -hmm. was, was that when the songwriting piece came into it for you? Because I can imagine you could look around and say, oh, all these people are really great guitar players, but who's, who's writing songs at that age that, that you would want to sing? 
there was a guy named Bill Johnson who who wrote a lot of instrumental music yeah. on on the guitar and it was very impressive I, and uh, and I kind of got interested in that but I don't think I really wrote my first song until after I graduated from high school and it was a uh, you know, I mean, I, I went into several songs that nobody ever heard. <laughs> it was my wastebasket period. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I wrote a song called Jesse, which was my, the first song I wrote and kept. And that ended up on my first CD, when, or first CD recording. It was an album. There were no CDs. <laughs> yeah, 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 but yeah. I, it ended up on my first album. And, uh, you know, when you play something and you're you're playing it in your own room, you think, I wonder if this is any good. You like it, you know. I mean, I thought it was okay. But then you play it for other people, and suddenly they think it's a good song, and you're thinking, huh, you know, so you kind of go from there. That worked. So tell us about Jesse, actually. There's a good story about this, about who Jesse is. I was on a train trip with some friends. I was going out to Montana, and uh, I had my guitar out. We were going to sing some songs, and there was this little girl named Jesse who was with her her parents, I think, and they were sitting in the train. It was going by train, and she was sitting there, and she said, play some train songs. And I kind of went, wow, I don't know any train songs. And she was like, play a train song. <laughs> and I was like, yep, I really don't know any, no, nope. you know, so we went back and forth, and I played other songs. I played other songs I thought this kid would like, and I thought, let's, let's try to deflect this. Let's try to you know, get her attention off of the train. She was having none of it. I mean, I think I ended up singing I've Been Working on the Railroad. That was so lame, and I'm so sorry. I hope the child will accept my <laughs> apology for this. So I wrote her a song after I got <laughs> home. Which she has never heard, as far as you know. As far as I know. Jesse, if you're watching this, please contact Anne and let her know <laughs> that you've heard the song. Yes, thank you. Right. Well, and this is another point about what you've done over the past 40 years is this clarity about what you're after mm -hmm. and what you're doing and what you have to do mm -hmm. to get there. And uh, as an independent artist now, that's not a very unusual thing. But when you started, that wasn't the template. It, it wasn't. Um, I, I think going your own way was, was rather unusual. And, and, you know, what I think back to um, when I was in probably junior high school, they had books that people would do and they would call them vanity presses, <laughs> which just made it sound bad. <laughs> you know, it just made it sound like, well, nobody else wants you, so you have to pay for it yourself. Um, now, this is what people are doing. Um, people are being independent artists. They're putting out their CDs by themselves, their books by themselves. Um, I, I think we celebrate that now. But in the beginning, what happened was that in, in 1989, 1990, uh, my manager, Lynn, and I went to Nashville because you had to have a publisher or a label. That's how you had things distributed, and it was kind of like that's the road you had to do. We went to Nashville. We met with everybody we wanted to meet with, all the labels and publishers. It was a very open and, and very welcoming um, community as far as music went. But everybody, and we talked to um, Richard Bennett, who was the producer for Emmylou Harris at the time, and, and he was very direct with us and just said, look, um, there are a lot of people in Nashville who would like to do something other than country music, but they're not going to because this is their bread and butter. So you're going to have to either decide that you're going to do that and then move over to that other side. He said, the other thing is that you're going to have to get somebody else to, to make your demos because somebody's going to listen to your demo and go, well, why doesn't she just sing it? Because her voice is strong enough. So we got a lot of input from them. They were very honest with us. We had a, a kind of the clarifying moment for me was we were sitting with Harold Shedd at Polygram uh, Records, and he had brought... Alabama to the forefront and stuff, and he was a real big producer. And he sat there, listened to our tape. It was a cassette tape that had three of my best songs on it. That's what we were told to do. Put three of your best songs on a cassette, and, and if they don't throw you out, you're in good shape. 
So he sat and he listened to the whole tape. And then he turned to Lynn. He never looked at me. But he turned to Lynn and he said, well, what does she wear when she's on stage? <laughs> and I kind of sat there and went, oh, wow, this could be very bad. <laughs> you know? But I just thought to myself, this really isn't about what I'm writing for them. This isn't about, and they really wanted what they already had. Mm -hmm. They wanted you to be the next whatever was hot at the time. Right. And I thought, this is not what I'm looking for. So we kind of made our minds up and just said, this is going to be us doing this. And um, if it's a smaller audience, that's fine. We'll, we'll get it out any way we can. Mm -hmm. But along came the internet, <laughs> and it made it a little easier. <laughs> Perfect timing there. Way to go, internet. Thank you. Just stepping in at the right moment. I know, moment. I know. But that was really a kind of a revolutionary realization for you at yeah. that time yeah. to make that particular choice. That was pretty, pretty brave, although some would uh, say maybe foolish, but it's turned out great. Yeah, and, and I don't know if it was brave or foolish. I do know... Um, that I, I, I could see my future <laughs> on mm -hmm. this one road, and I thought, man, that's, I'm not going to be happy. That's just not going to make me happy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, to have them dress me up and give me other people's songs to play, and I, I just couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be a songwriter. I wanted to, this is what I wanted to do. I mean, I, I had a vision <laughs> in my head of, the, of what mm -hmm. I wanted to be doing. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about your voice then when you, you know? Oh, I've never liked my voice. You've never liked your voice? No, I never have. And um, I, I like the feeling of singing. Mm -hmm. That's what I love. I love the feeling of singing, but I don't like listening to my voice. I, You're the only one, but well, go ahead. I, I used to sit in a studio. I used to have to leave the room when they would play my, because I, I just couldn't deal with it. I'm better now. Mm -hmm. It's... Is it because it's deeper than the I don't know. Standard I don't know what it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's just because you know what yeah. you're doing wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, you're hearing yeah. everything. But mm -hmm. I, I mean I I've I've kind of made peace with it now, but I just I just I love the feeling of singing. I just right. like the just that just that physical feeling of singing is, mm -hmm. is wonderful. Well, and you've learned to write in a way that shows right. off its strengths. Well, and that's been something that I've done on purpose too, um, kind of writing songs that kind of go make me work a little bit. Um, it goes out of my range. It, it, uh, it helps me to really, really stretch as a singer. So you leave Nashville and you know at that point you're not going to be part of a major record label and you're not going to go out and wear the spangly clothes that they want you to wear <laughs> on stage and you're not going to fall into the country music right. mold. You're going to do it differently. You're going right. to write your own songs and you're going to perform them. And you had to build a whole business model around that in order to support what you were trying to do. We, we did. And, and it was... Um... It's one of these things where, yeah, it's fine to say you're going to make your CD and you're going to write your own songs, but who's going to hear them? <laughs> right, because there's a whole structure there of distribution and everybody who wants a little piece of the pie right. is going to get their part if you follow that standard path. Right. I, I think the beautiful thing about the CD happening was that at first when CDs started, the manufacturing was such where, is, you know, they told you, oh, we have to make the glass master, and then we have to do this, and we have to do that, and so we need you to order at least 2,000 of them. And we were like, oh, God, okay. Well, then we found that these companies started popping up that would make them on demand. You could order 50. So we found one in town, and we said, well, this makes it a lot easier for us to do this. Because you don't have to overcommit. You don't have to overcommit. You don't have to carry the inventory with you. So come tax time, you have to do all that inventory stuff. Um, and we started to make, you know, we started to try things. Okay, well, maybe we should make some greeting cards from, from the lyrics. Or maybe we should make some T-shirts from the lyrics. We'll make our own touring T-shirt. We'll, we'll do this. And it started to become a joke when we... I mean, a little bit of a joke when we would come into a concert because it would be the Ann Reed Boutique needs two tables, you know, yeah. and, and people would just sit there and go, oh, my God, how much stuff do you have? <laughs> you <know? laughs> and we, we started to have things like um, we started to uh, contact a company called 
ridge frog industries that had these beautiful rulers that were all about, you know, the women of music and women in mm -hmm. literature and, liter and women in sports, kind of dovetailing with the Heroes Project. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started to do things like the Heroes Show, uh, which we did with, with NPR. Um, that was a way of, of making a play out of it or making a performance piece out of it. It was a little bit of sitting down and saying, what else can we do? I mean, this was the marketing part of it. This mm -hmm. was the how do we how do we make money while we sleep? And this was at a time when branding was still primarily something that happened to cattle. That's right. But <laughs> you were at the forefront of the idea of a person as a brand. Right. I mean, there. I mean, there are people who were buying things because it was at my concert. It was connected to it you. It was connected to right. me in and some they way. Look at that, and right. they they. They think of you and Sojourner Truth at the and same Sojourner time. At the That's same time. great company to be in. Very <laughs> smart. <laughs>